Welcome to Jonas. So, let me tell you guys what Starbright is. Okay, Starbright is the largest independent star community and in the six hundred city chapter in the two hundred countries. And today we will have talked about how a Guangzhou star grew ten times and sell the scratch ball to three million dollars. Wow, it's amazing. So, welcome our host, Richie, and our guest, Nicholas. Thank you, Dad, and the side of the power of the world. We the first ball and three million dollars. Welcome. for Nicholas and his uh, wonderful office. You can see uh, the product is over there and over here. It's amazing. And before uh, we started, I would love to have you to have a style introduction of yourself to let our audience to get to know yourself better. Yeah, please. Hey everyone, I'm Nicholas. I'm from Germany. I've been an entrepreneur all my life and a skateboarder all my life. I love sports, so that's why it turned out to be a sports company. Um, I've been living in Guangzhou for three years, but I've been in China on and off for the last ten years, and I absolutely love it here. Like the first time I came, I knew I just wanted to come back as quickly as possible, and I still had to finish my studies, so I always had to go back and forth. But since three years, I'm here fixed. Okay, great. So um, I know you before you found like uh, two hats here. You have uh, also started your business related to uh, skateboard, I think back to 2007, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what you learned from your previous experience and what you inspired you at that time to uh, found it two hats after? So can you share the story before two hats? Yeah, um, actually in 2007 that was the, probably the biggest company I founded before two hats. So, yeah. But before that I already founded companies, so like all my life. Um, I guess the first real one was a skateboarding school when I was 16 and after that it just kept going. So in 2007 there was a skateboarding brand, it was called Droshki, it's still sold on Taobao now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like originally I wanted to become a pro skateboarder until I found out that the companies hiring the pro skateboarders earn much more than the pro skateboarders, that's how I got into running the skateboard company. Afterwards, like when I was running my own brand, other, other companies asked if I can, or my competitors asked if I can run their productions too. And initially that turned out to be a more fun business for me than having my own brand. Um, I had to quit because like, it was super weird. I um, was finishing my bachelor and my grades were pretty bad because I was putting all my time into building the company. And so my small German university said, said that I can't do a master there. And I wanted to finish a master. And then in Hong Kong, they had uh, Hong Kong UST, which was the eighth best business school in the world at that time. I just thought, like, let's see what they say. So I applied there and told them about my company. And then they said, just because of the company, they would take me. So I was like, wow, I got around studying and get to a good university. So um, yeah, I quit the business to fully focus on the MBA in Hong Kong and at Cornell it was like a joint program. After the um, studies, I wanted to get back into business. So first, the sourcing wasn't the right thing for me, and it turns out that two hex running sports equipment productions is a lot of fun. Yeah. So, um, what you um, learn from the last experience that can actually can support you to um, be your decision to start a business of two hex? Okay. Like why you? Why two hex? Yeah. So I did a skateboarding company, and later I did a sourcing company, and it turns out that I have to love the product. Like, if I take a skateboard component or another sport equipment component into my hands, I absolutely love it. It is well done. And um, I was doing, like when I did sourcing, I did all kinds of different products. And when I sourced them, I was just not interested in it. And in order to build a good business, you I think you have to love the product. That makes it much easier. Okay. So you love skateboard very much? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Who plays skateboard here? <laughs> oh, okay. Some. <laughs> I think today, uh, for most of you, the audience, um, uh, for your most interesting uh, part would be the secret behind the tenfold growth for a business. Um, because, um, Nicholas, you also mentioned that uh, you have a year by year uh, tenant growth, I think, from three, four years ago. 
Yeah, so that's amazing. Every year you have 10x growth. So what's the, what's the secret behind every 10x growth? You like, want to share with us? Is yeah. it a secret you cannot share? Or? No, actually I would <laughs> like to share it because also we are filming this because I want to put it on YouTube for my, our customers to see okay. because I want them to grow 10x yeah, too. Please. So um, I'm glad to share this. Um, every, like at every step of the way, growing 10x is different. So yeah. in the beginning, like I really had to put a lot of effort into marketing and making the company seem much bigger than it was at that time. Um, and that really helped to do the first big step forward. Like the customers that called had to have the feeling we are a big company in order to place big orders. So the, this was the first step, and then. From there, the next time to get the tanks growth was uh, sales. Sales was super important. Like, all, a lot of entrepreneurs don't like to do sales. So they build a great product, and then they feel like, okay, people come, buy it, but they don't like to push the product. And you absolutely have to leave your comfort zone and go out and sell, like, really do five hours per day just sales calls. And uh, I did that for around a year, and it helped to make the next 10x growth possible. So, uh, which is the uh, very big market for, for your products when you do the sales? Mm, it the was time? when I did myself. It was mainly the German-speaking countries. Okay. And later um, we went into USA, and with Damon joining, we uh, very much expanded in the US. Mm -hmm. So now we're yeah mostly in Europe and the USA. Okay. So marketing, sales, and yeah, like at one point of time, I couldn't handle all the sales myself anymore. Mm -hmm. So in, like, I was stuck again, like, I, I couldn't grow from that point. The only way to do the next step was hiring. And if you want to grow 10x in one year, you have to hire pretty fast. Um, so yeah, like uh, the 2 hex team is back there. And like hiring great people was super difficult. Like I had to convince each of them to join. Um, but only like if you get really good people, then you can keep the speed. Like some people, they're good founders, and then they hire some okay, uh, like uh, an okay team, and then you're just stuck because they can't take, like they can't keep the speed that you started with. So, so. What, what kind of people you are looking for at this time? Yeah, so now we're, right now in your team. Yeah, now actually we are still hiring right now. We need six more people. Wow. Um, so if we could all exchange WeChat later and talk, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> or the important thing you see in the people that you think, oh, you are the guy, you should be in my team. So, like, there's two parts to it. Some people have to be um, very organized, and some people have to be very social. So if you want to do sales, you have to be social. And, yeah. and still smart. So, uh, but mm -hmm. if you're just smart, it doesn't help you make sales. You've got to be really like likable and, and um, outgoing and open. And that was what I was looking for in sales, mm -hmm. and uh, David fit that role perfectly. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's like you have to find someone who clicks with your customers. Okay. Uh, someone who has got a similar style, similar interests, and then it works. And for the other positions, um, like, how can I best explain? If you want to organize, uh, then you have to be, find someone really organized. Um, so you can share what kind of position you're looking for right now, so people may can share, share the information to their friends as well. Okay, yeah, so we're looking for, oh wait, let's start, a CAD designer to do um, 3D files. We're looking for a graphic designer for catalogs and for the website design. We're looking for an HR manager to help us grow the team. We're looking for professional athletes to build their product segments, so someone for um, um, fitness, snowboarding, surfing, stand-up paddling, and even other sports. Like if someone comes in and says, I'm, I love the sport, I love the products, and I'd like to make two hacks, I don't know, um, hard to find a product right now. Mm -hmm. like, even if it was two hacks soccer, it would probably work out. Um, even that's like the furthest one we probably don't want to do right now, but just any sport would actually, um, yeah, we're looking for the athletes. Then, who else are we looking for? Do you remember? I forgot it. Snowboarding, surfing, uh, any sport, hiking, like anything. <laughs> Mountain bikers, yeah. Uh, but we have some more positions. Oh, yeah, uh, full-time marketer. 
definitely looking for that. Do you think hiring is the very challenging part when you grow a business? Because mm -hmm. I, I just saw you, <laughs> every time I just... I, I hiring is super difficult. Yeah, can like, you share some um, You just have to go through tons of, like, first you get the CVs, then you have to think about if they might fit, and um, the problem is, if they fit, they probably don't want to join. Because you want those people that are the best. And if you want the best people, mm -hmm. then they want the best company. And so you have to convince them that you're the best company that offers the best potential. Yeah. Um, and that makes it really hard because, well, it's like finding a partner. You're, like, you don't just take anyone to take the best person, but then for the best person to like you too. Um, it's really seldom that finding the right or the best employee is the same way. So uh, you just said that uh, hiring is the second year or the third year that when we can take for the growth. It was the within like the first year the company wasn't registered and I yeah. just built the website and made some marketing material. Yeah. And then the first official year mm -hmm. sales was the most important part, and then the yeah, second right. official year the hiring was most okay. important. Okay. And now we're in the third. Okay. So what about the third year? What so now we've got. Important? the third uh, year going and uh, uh, like now I can't look into retrospect I have to look in the future so I can't tell if it works but the plan is to uh, scale and expand into different segments and um, so keep the old growth going we want to be stronger in skateboarding we want to increase the team we want to increase our marketing so the old ways of growing we still keep growing but with those ways we wouldn't be able to achieve 10x one more time so the only way for us to achieve 10x one more time is if we grow into more different products. So if we copy what we did for skateboarding and do it for at least four more products, that's one way. And then another way is if we don't just do manufacturing but also have our own brand for those five different sports segments. And then do some more vertical integrations, that means probably even open our own shops. Like we have to go into more different, like use our strengths to go into more areas that we haven't been in before to keep growing at that speed. Okay, so you share um, for the past three years, so marketing, sales, hiring is the very most important. Now expansion. Yeah, yeah, expansion. So for example, marketing and sales, do you have some um, story to share with, with the audience that how, what kind of marketing campaign or sales tactic you, you just uh, make to have two has stood out compared mm -hmm. to other competitors? It really depends on the skills of the entrepreneur. So mm -hmm. I think everybody like, has different skills and I really liked um, programming. I'm absolutely not professional in it, but I, absolutely, I very much enjoy it and I like automation. And so yeah, automation. we put a lot of work since the beginning into automation. So we automated marketing and right now um, Rain is working on automating sales. Um, and like automation helped us since the beginning because it let, it let us scale the marketing. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever we did marketing, we were thinking about which ways of marketing are not limited uh, in growth. So for example, if you make catalogs and go to an exhibition and hand them out, mm -hmm. you've got that once, but then it's kind of hard to scale it up, except if you hire people and go to more exhibitions. That would probably be a way, but... Um, so we strongly focused on um, learning online marketing and retargeting and different ways of um, just standing out online. Okay, so uh, regarding online marketing is on, for example, Facebook, Twitter? Yeah, like uh, we don't do Twitter, we do Facebook, Google, uh, Instagram, yeah. and um, YouTube. Okay, so which channel you for is the most important? Or you will take us very successful, successful? It's so hard to say. Like, it really depends on which you put the most focus. Some companies are extremely good at uh, marketing on Instagram. And uh, we lag behind there, want to be stronger there. We are pretty good, I think, at Google marketing. And we are pretty bad at Facebook marketing. So um, it really depends on the company. So some really hit it hard on Facebook. And then they redirect you from Facebook to a click funnel and uh, make the sale. And it's like really different by company. I guess ours is uh, Google marketing. Okay. So um, maybe the audience also would love to uh, get more clear idea about how the skateboard mm -hmm. sell to the um, the end customer. Yeah. So usually how it comes um, mm -hmm. for the the whole process. Definitely. Like if you want to build a company, you are the first salesperson. 
And if, but you've got, to, you've got to do everything. So if you're unorganized and you're good at sales, you can't build the company because you have to organize the company. If you're great at um, organizing, but which often comes with being kind of more introverted, then um, you're probably pretty bad at sales. So either way, you have to leave your comfort zone. Either way, like if you're extroverted and like outgoing, you have to get organized and structured, which probably makes it, doesn't make you feel comfortable. So you have to sit down and do your paperwork three hours a day, and you have to structureize yourself and follow up on all the plans you set for yourself. And let's say you are the person that is super structured and write everything down, then you probably feel very uncomfortable calling the customers and convincing them to buy something. And so you have to do both no matter what. In the beginning, you're the person doing everything. And so most people have difficulties doing sales because you probably have to be like the most extroverted and outgoing to call customers. And for most people, that's super uncomfortable. And a lot of people like, pick up the phone and they feel like, what happens if the customer tells us that we're bad? Or what happens if he says he doesn't want my phone call? And you have to leave all those fears behind and just do that call. Um, if you have a good marketing in, in your back, so that the customer already knows who you are and what you're selling, and so you just follow up on his email, that makes it a lot easier. But let's say you're just starting and you just barely launched your website, then calling customers can be super awkward um, in the beginning. But the, like, the thing you have to learn is the more often you call, the better you get, and the more comfortable you feel about it. And when you feel really natural, the customer will feel natural about your calling. Um, and so what I did, like, which was really helpful, actually a customer taught that to me. Uh, he said, whenever a company reaches out to you, you have to write down the company name, the contact person, the phone number, the date they call, like they messaged you, and what they wanted to buy, and the last date, the time you reached out to them, and the result. So you have to have that Excel chart, and then it uh, should automatically count the days that you haven't heard back from them. And the goal of this is to get a yes or a no. So if you have good marketing, you probably have uh, five or six new people reaching out to you. So um, at the end of the month, you probably have 150 contacts if you did good online marketing. Like everybody, normally people will just get the emails, try to call, nobody answers, put it in the delete folder, that's it. But no, you have to get a yes or no. So you keep on calling until they pick up. And if they pick up and you say, let's say in our case, skateboards, we say, hey, you sent an email, you want 500 skateboards. I suggest you do 2,000. Do you want to do that? And he's like, like, like the most common answer is, yeah, we wanted skateboards, that's why we emailed you, but probably not right now, not so sure, we still have to talk about it. And that's a maybe. You never agree, accept a maybe. But you have to accept it in that moment. So you write down, he said maybe, and you ask him, okay, what time should I call you again? And he's gonna be like, um, I don't know. You're like, how about I just call you next week? And then he's like, whatever. So <laughs> next week, you pick up that phone, you know it's gonna be uncomfortable. He's like, who are you? And like, I called last week, you said you maybe wanted 500 boards. He's like, oh yeah. Like, Did you talk to your business partner about it? He said, like I checked like what was the last thing I wrote down. It's like he wanted to talk to his business partner. So he's like, no, I didn't. I'm like, okay, I'll give you another week. And you just have to do that until the customer says yes or no. And you'll be surprised by how often, often they say yes. So because if you get an email, they actually want it, but they feel very unsafe because you are no one. Like they're a company you've never heard about, they've never heard about. You just have a small website, nothing else, no references. But still, like most of the customers reaching out are lazy, so they will not ask a lot of other companies. They just they just want to get it out there, send an email, and then see what happens. And if you're that person calling back most often and pushing him to say yes or no, they actually feel much safer with you because they think you're really serious about it. And that's what it takes. So, like I said, if you market good, then probably at the end of one month you can have up to 150 contacts. And you just have to be that one company that calls them again and again until they give you a yes or no. And that's how you make that step. Um, into actually becoming a kind of a bigger company. But if you feel unsafe about doing that, you won't get the first big sales and you'll stay one person and it just it won't go on. So because either the customers need to see that you are a big company and strong, or you need to push them to buy. Okay. So um, to have the customer to say yes and no, mm -hmm. or no, um, do you have any other um, Suggestion for your salesperson in your team. All right, that was, a, that was a keyword I was waiting for. Damien, <laughs> can you help me with this? Can you come to the front? <laughs> yeah, Damien is doing sales, so he's the best person to answer. Take the chair. <laughs>
I can be close to this person. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hello? Yes. Yeah, because the sales is, I think sales is the most important thing for a business, right? Um, it's so hard to say, but you have to have sales. If you have no sales, yes. you have no business. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. what is the piece? <laughs> oh gosh. Like the question was, what do we do to sell? Like how, what makes the customer buy? How do yeah. we sell? Uh, it's pretty much just like trust and being friends. Like you kind of get on the same level and like know what they want, uh -huh. and like you just kind of build like a relationship together. It takes times usually. Yeah, but then that's what like what Nicholas was saying. You like call back and like follow up and stuff, and then you like build a relationship and you're like, oh hey, what's up? How you doing? And like you can see like you know each other, you know. And like like some of my customers, you like uh, you'll know like about them, like oh how are your kids doing and stuff. Like oh cool yeah, and you can just talk, and then they feel like really comfortable, and then you can then they'll end up like buying even more too. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. So the secret is your personality. I <laughs> guess you just be you just be friendly. Yeah, the relationship. Relationship. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I think. Cool. Yeah, it, it's cool to learn that, but I think it's hard to copy that. Do you think so? Um, it if, just... if the, some other business person, um, they, they sell other products, and they want to copy some secret uh, <laughs> patents from you guys, what, what, what's your suggestion? Uh, yeah. I think it's just like trial and error. Just you just gotta try. It's the same with skateboarding. Okay, <laughs> sales is like skateboarding. Okay, so pretty much, okay. like in skateboarding, you're failing most of the time. Like most of the time, you're trying a trick and you're never landing it. But you have to like keep trying and trying and trying, and then you finally get it, and you're like, oh, and then it clicks in your head, like, oh, I got it, you know. So it's like it's the same thing, but you just like talk to people. You just keep calling them and be like, hey, what's up? How are you doing? Is everything fine? What do you need? You just keep trying and you keep failing and fucking up and how you get hurt, but then you just you keep going and then eventually you'll do it and you'll land the trick, you land the sale or whatever, you know? So <laughs> you just keep trying and then you'll eventually just do it. It's kind of just like you just keep going. Just keep going and you grow and get better. It's pretty much like anything in life. You just keep trying and give it your best. And if you mess up, that's part of it. You learn from it and you just keep going. So I would say, like, to get better, you just keep trying. And keep doing, and then if something is, like, awkward or uncomfortable, you're like, okay, that was weird. Don't, maybe I don't say that, you know, or something. Or maybe, like, I'll try this, you know. So I feel like it's, like, adapting to, like, the people and just keep trying. Yeah, so, yeah. because last year is very difficult for, I think, for most of the people. Um, so... Also, do team also um, think that is you uh, you face more difficulty last year when you do the sales because you cannot visit the customer. Um, you can only do the uh, remote course, remote meetings, etc. So, uh, is it have some impact on your business last year? Well, uh, last year I wasn't I wasn't here yet, so this is like oh, okay. yeah, this is still, still yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah like All right. Okay, Ben, you'll see, baby. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Ben. For the support. <laughs> yeah, last year. So yeah, we went like I went to visit customers in the beginning, and visiting customers is super helpful. Like like Damon said, you have to build a relationship with the customers, and there's no easier way to build a relationship than talking face to face going out, having dinner, and just enjoying time. Especially if you share something. And so what we share with our customers is that we love skateboarding. And so maybe we just take our boards, go to the skate park, and brings back the memories from when we were younger, and I don't know, just pr practice together and show each other the tricks that we do in our countries, a little different, or call them a little different. It just creates a bond. And then we trust the customer, the customer trusts us, and we know how to talk to each other. And also it helps, like it's really important for us to know at which stage the customer is and what he needs. And it's very important for the customer to understand what we can offer. And if we understand each other fully and it's a fit, then that's amazing. Like some customers, 
they need exactly what we offer, and we need like we can offer exactly what they need, and um, also like we clicked really well as friends, and for some of them we've been together since the beginning, and we always grow together. So once like these are lucky customers; they don't happen very often, and but you won't find out who is a customer like this until you visited them. So last year, so that would be impact lots if you want. Usually, it's, uh, uh, like so, yeah, meet people in person. Yeah. Um, well, last year was special with COVID. Um, yeah. So actually, how I even start. Like last year was not about last year. It's not really about marketing. It's not about sales. It's not about um, visiting customers. Last year was just about. It's a big mess, and. Let's say you throw a lot of people into a pot that everybody's fighting to survive and whoever is most creative and fights best <laughs> turns out to be the winner. Um, and those old established big factories, they're not that good when they're thrown into a pot. Like they're good when they're in their turf where they feel safe and where they can continue their process without changing. But all of them were in big struggles with COVID. But we are the small team, all of us were creative and um, solution oriented. So let's say, for example, um, DHL and UPS said they don't ship anymore. Like everything is full with medical equipment. So when you would call a factory at that time, the factory would say, hey, well, we got the boards, but you can't buy them right now because we can't ship. Like we call DHL, they don't ship. We call US UPS, they don't ship. So they are no goods. So all the shops in Europe were empty. All skate shops had no stock. And our customers called and said, we have this huge potential here. All the shops are empty. You have goods, we need goods. How can we make this happen? So we kept calling DHL and UPS and we just asked, like, is there any way you can ship this out? And they said, sorry, we have the medical equipment first. And um, then one of our team found out that we can ship the goods to um, the DHL or UPS warehouse and they would put it on the plane as soon as there's like a small space free on the plane. Mm -hmm. So that was like not plannable. So they would say, yeah, we can put it into the warehouse, but we don't know when it's going to ship out. But we told this to our customers, said, this is the case, and if you agree with that, then we can ship out. So yeah, we kept on shipping stuff to DHL and UPS warehouse, and whenever they had some space in the plane, they would just throw it in. But it was not planable, but we agreed to that. So we got our stuff quickly to Europe and to USA, and the big factories didn't. So our customers at that time grew really quickly because they were the only ones having stock. Um, and yeah, like at that time it was not about the usual techniques. At that time it was more like about who can find a solution to a current problem the fastest. That was just one example. Like COVID came with so many problems. Yeah. And each time, like a normal established company needs probably half a year or something to solve a problem. And if you can solve the problem within three or four days or maybe a week, then you're the only one in the whole world being able to supply that product right now. And we did that a couple of times, and it really pushed us to the front. So that was very helpful. And it's tough to say COVID was helpful, but it definitely was to our business. Okay. So do you, do you think that COVID also impacted the, the potential market? Because people may uh, prefer to stay at home and not to play outside. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you see some decline of the um, the need for for the uh, skateboard and some related products at that time last year? Skateboarding tripled over the last one year. Why? In size. Can, can you share and there are two reasons. Like nobody knows exactly why. There because Triple, like, wow. Yeah, it tripled. Um, but like everyone expects that it has two reasons. First, skateboarding was supposed to join the Olympics this year. Uh, okay. Which was delayed but still um, a lot of old people take like the skate before take out the boards again and see that it's going to become mainstream, or like, it's coming back, not mainstream, but it's going to uh, be big again, so mm -hmm. we have this growth, and then at the same time, you're not allowed to meet friends, so you can't go play, um, you can't go to the gym, gyms are closed, mm -hmm. you can't uh, go play basketball with friends, you can't play soccer with friends, you have to do something alone, and, and you have to keep a distance between everyone. Mm -hmm. So skateboarding was just right that. So you could meet friends, everybody would keep a 5 or 10 meter gap, it's outside where the wind is blowing, so you're safe and um, still you can do a sport. 
So all, all, all outdoor sports and individual sports actually exploded. So um, they were, you couldn't buy a bike anymore in Germany because too many people wanted to go biking. You couldn't buy skateboards. Uh, right now, um, the fitness segment has the same issue. You have difficulties getting fitness equipment because people can't go to the gym, so they work at home. Um, and it just expands over a lot of different product segments. Some uh, areas went down, like gyms, and some other areas in sports went up. And yeah, it's just been a big change and big mess, but very interesting. Yeah, because most of your products, you just share that um, the market is in Europe and in the States. Yeah. Um, so what about the China market? Is it, your, um, is it growing, a growing market for your business? China is growing <coughs> extremely fast. So I was running my own skateboard brand, and um, which is now continued by um, a, uh, it's by BSS distribution in Shenzhen. And when I worked with BSS on getting the products to China, when we started, China had 49 skate shops. And by the time I stopped working with them, which is like a few years ago, they had 200 shops. And by now it should probably be around 1,000 skate shops if you take the 100 skate shops into account. So skateboarding is growing extremely fast in China. But China is um, a different market. Like, you've got a few markets which are uh, Brand, like very strongly brand and quality oriented. So, um, USA is very strongly like this, so they're willing to pay a much higher price if the quality is um, like fits to that um, price. Then the same is true for uh, some European countries, and the same is true for Japan and South Korea. But then that pretty much ends. Like, pretty much all other countries we try to work with um, care very strongly about the price and don't care that much about uh, reliability of the supplier or uh, continuous quality. Um, and so we tried selling to other countries too, but it's so much more difficult that we decided to focus on a few countries first, and then we're going to the more difficult, difficult countries later. And I think for China, we have to have a stronger brand image before we can really enter this market. Because China has some strong local players, that are well known here but not abroad and in order to compete with them here in China we have to have a much stronger image in China. Okay, so, so do you have any plan for the China market to... Late, probably in three years. Okay, so not right now? Not right now. Okay, yeah. So, um, for, I think for most of the part we have learned your, how you grow your business. So, um, can you also share what you What's the most proud uh, you you think is proud of last year in 2019? Although it's very difficult. Yeah. Proud, proud. Proud of yourself. <laughs> That's so hard. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. I'm not really proud. I'm I'm happy. It's, it's different. Like I can't okay. really say that I feel proud of anything. It's, okay. It's, so what made you happy last year? Um, well, I'm super happy about the new office. Like, oh, okay. when, we, when we moved into here, like, we had this tiny office in Pacho. Okay. It was, like, probably this size. <laughs> and, and, and we already, like, our team was already growing. And so we had two tables, but we couldn't fit any other table. Okay. And so, yeah, like, not everybody could sit on the table. And not everybody, like, we couldn't fit all chairs. So the last person coming to work, um, did not get to sit on the table and did not get a chair. <laughs> um, and also, like, we had a glass window wall, but the government built another office in front of us, so suddenly it was all dark, so it felt like we were in the basement, and we, we, some of us had to sit on the floor. That's why we have the yellow beanbag. So, Damien often came in last, and he was fine sitting on the floor, and then he decided to get a beanbag. And now we like the beanbags, so that's how it started. Okay. But it, in the beginning, yeah, because we had to sit on the floor. And so when we moved to this office, that was like, felt like we are finally free to stand, walk around, get a quiet corner, take a call. Yeah. So that probably what made me happiest. And um, okay. also the team growth makes me extremely happy. Um, it was pretty lonely starting. And like I started in my, in a tiny apartment in Jaya um, Wangang. And like staying, I stayed at home for, I think, half a year, just like working at home, sleeping at home, and it gets really lonely. 
And then I moved to Starbucks when I had some money. So um, Starbucks was not that much better. I sometimes met people, but it was still pretty lonely. <laughs> uh, but you have to get through it in order to build a business. Then um, we moved to a co-working space. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time it got really fun because uh, we got to meet other companies. But still, you don't have people that struggle with you together. And then when we uh, started building the team, then it got really fun because when we would run into a problem, we would run into a problem together. That's a totally different feeling. Okay. Yeah, good to hear that. And congratulations for your new office. Thank yeah, you. Yes, much bigger, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it also. It, it, it's not like a basement anymore. Yeah. And what, what did you uh, leave unfinished in last year, do you think, and you want to complete it oh. this year? That's like that's probably what pushes me absolutely most. Um, I think everything is unfinished. Like, everything. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to X to be super quickly the biggest sports equipment company in the world, and we're working extremely hard on it. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait for it to happen. And um, and there's such a strong drive that I feel absolutely everything is unfinished until we have achieved that goal. But it's not last year. It's not this year. It will probably take a little longer. But yeah, until that time, I feel very unfinished. We're looking for it for if you we complete soon. So uh, right now we have some time for open questions. So if you have questions, just yeah, please. So I have just please stand up. Okay. So I have a question. So you can make more B two B like selling uh, like manufacture your uh, products, or you do your own brands in the US market? And uh, we help American and European brands arrange their productions. And we do so with a much higher quality than all the other suppliers. And um, we now plan to create our own branded products. So what we're working on first is a skateboard truck. And uh, then from there we'll just expand the portfolio. Because in order to keep this growth, we have to bring our own brand into the market too. And we want to do so for all the new sports uh, areas we're going to go in in 2021. Okay, so, uh, so uh, how you want to do, so when you do manufacture for other brands in the United States, like, do you go to any trade shows or any platforms, you know, like, how, or something like mental college? It's um, online marketing. We, we don't actually do much physical, like, presence anywhere. We, um, we also stopped traveling to customers because of COVID. Yeah. So it's all turned into online and, um, yeah, we still do that. So we, when we do online advertising, we just target uh, the US and Europe. Okay. But online, is it Google advertising or is it Google, um, Facebook, yeah. YouTube? Google, YouTube. Ad Google advertising. TikTok? Yeah. Um, TikTok, no, no. We, um, it's pretty like, pretty like just Instagram, Google, Facebook, and YouTube. How, long, how, how much money is spent a day for all these platforms? I'm just curious. Very little. <laughs> like so little that we actually almost get it free. We like we we strongly target, and um, also we try to do as much of the like automate as much of the advertising on our own website instead of on other channels. And um, so we try to get the people into our own automated marketing channel as quickly as possible so that we don't have to spend money on advertising. Like for example, you can, if you, you can place advertisement on YouTube to play the video, to keep on playing the same video to the customer until he buys from you. But all the way, the marketing will stay on someone else's website and then you keep on paying. But if you lead the customer to use your own website, then on your own website you can market to them or like on different channels that you own, then um, you don't have to pay anymore. So we try to quickly move the customer away from where we have to pay to somewhere where we, where we don't have to pay. Yeah, yeah I mean, I also have, like, I've been a lot of co-colleagues and myself and the platforms and on my website, but, like, it's very hard for me to make money with the website, and then it's, it's, it's also hard for you to get views on YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, so it's just, like, that's, that's why I'm struggling with my audience. For, for um, Think about how much I want to share about our marketing technique. Because we developed our marketing over, like, I've been working on this for quite a long time, um, and we kind of cracked it quite well. Um, where should I start? Like, 
probably the best way is to not just do uh, marketing the way, it, like, you, like, not just, like, if you go on Google and it shows you how to place a banner ad, and then you place a banner ad, that's not enough. You have to think of the whole funnel. You have to think of how do you get the customer to buy the product. And you have to advertise each step of the way. So in the beginning, like, um, I'll just look into funnels, that helps a lot. And um, like trial and error. Try what works and see what doesn't work um, on different channels and see where the costs are lowest. So for example, with, you've got the um, AdWords cost per click. And then you can try different AdWords um, and you can push down the cost per click a lot and then you can also calculate which uh, word had the biggest conversion. And you can try it on cost like this quite a bit. And yeah, that's like some of the standard words. Okay, thank you. Hey, Ali. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, so <clears throat> you know, describing your, your company and how it grew over time, it's really, really impressive. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Um, and also, I just wanted to ask, because I'm a tech guy, so, you know, this is a manufacturing sort of uh, real world company, but I know that you also put a lot of investment into automation, and you described before automating your sales channel, automating your marketing. So can you talk a little bit about how much, uh, how tech is important to your business and how it helped you grow? Thanks for the question. I love tech. That's why I'm happy to hear that. Um, yeah, so, where should I start? Um, the more you automate, the lower your cost costs will be. So let's say we needed to get out of that area of competing with traders. Like, you've got so many companies trading skateboard equipment from China. And um, if we spend all our time calling the customers and competing with traders, we have no time to develop our products. And the only way to win in the end is if we have the best products for a really strong price. Um, and so we wanted to put all of our time in there. So that means the rest has to be automated. Um, and so we put a high focus on um, building configurators. So, like, normally when you find a website, they tell you here we have skateboard decks, skateboard trucks, and some other products, and then you just uh, have a look at it, and then you feel that's fine, then you call them, and then you say, how much are 500 skateboard trucks? They say, they calculate the price, give it to you tomorrow, then tomorrow you call back and say, okay, how much would it be if I make it a little wider, a little, like a little red at the bottom, and then it goes back and forth maybe for one and a half months, you keep on quoting, you spend a lot of time on it, and then in the end he says, okay, actually your competitor made it a little cheaper. Um, and like this, you, like trading companies, many of them don't make that much money because they're in this struggle. So we spend a lot of time uh, on automation. Um, we have Rain in the back, he's our super coder. He built the 2Hex website, so um, it's uh, like, you can build the product online and automatically calculate the price in real time. And this allows us to not have to quote anymore. So also the customers feel happy because instead of having to wait for a quotation for one day or something, they get the quotation instantly. And um, let's take, like, the configurator can actually offer much more than a factory. For example, um, I once talked to a wheel factory and I told them like, hey, you've got these amazing techniques, some way you can mix different urethane colors, some way you have like the material inside is harder than the outside. Why don't you offer these to your customers? And they said, because then the quotation gets so complex and in the end, they actually just want white wheels anyway. Um, and so by not automating, your selection actually gets smaller than bigger. And by automating, like right now for skateboard decks, our website has over 1 million different options. Um, just because Let's say in the first step, you have 30 different sizes. Then in the second step, you have 10 different materials. So you're already at 30 times 10, at uh, 300 different options. And then at the next step, you have um, 10 different ways of curving the skateboard. That's uh, 300 times 10, is 3,000. And then if you end up like having much, like, much more selections per step, and you have 11 steps, you end up with an ex extreme big number of customization options, much bigger than any other factory would uh, quote, just because um, of automating it. And you save, the, like, you save the time of calculating the price, and the more, like, if you, have, if you wouldn't have had the website and they customize it so strongly, it gets really kind of hard to calculate the price, takes a lot of time. 
and it stops you from growing. Hey, please. What do you put more effort on, um, sales or manufacturing? Um, it changed over time. It changes frequently. So sometimes we have a really strong product portfolio, and I feel we could do better in sales. Then I will put more effort into sales. And um, sometimes, like we sell a lot, but uh, we have a problem in the production, and then I spend almost all my time trying to solve that product and get manufactured right again. So it really changes month by month. Um, but yeah, now, the, now my manufacturing part of the team takes over those most problems. The sales part of the team does most takes care of that problems. And yeah, I'm just basically right now I don't go that far into one of the or either. I just solve problems. Thank you. Okay, please. Hey. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is because of the uh, yeah. high hours. Speak up. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> your voice. I have two questions. <laughs> yeah. One is about your pricing, and the second one is about your branding. <laughs> about pricing, you're not scared of you know just giving your price you know straight to anybody because you know I've been working for two years and I have you know, this problem with batteries. Actually, they don't want to give you the price because they don't they want to be compared with other. But I think it's stupid because. That's your business, you're trying to sell me, so you have to give me a price, right? <laughs> and the second one is about branding, like how the later when you do your brand, how do you think about uh, competing against bigger brand? Because you know skateboarding is like a very old industry like where people just like the you know the famous brand. <laughs> For the quotations. Um like when I came to China, I worked for a Chinese company and I was doing sales uh, to, uh, to the Western countries. And the company once told me, don't give them the price in the beginning, give them the price as late as possible. I was like, why? He says, because the more time they invest in you, the more they don't want to switch manufacturers later. Um, so I was there trying to chat with them and phone with them as long as possible in order to really like, make sure they have no time to compare prices. <laughs> um, it was a terrible way for, for me, I felt. <laughs> um, later it turns out that like, our customers have to know that we offer a great price for the quality. So we have to bring them to the point where they know that, yeah, maybe they can save a little bit, but it's going to take them three or four or five months and then it's even not as safe because with us they do a lot of different products so to add one more product is super safe uh, because they know us and at the same time we have extremely competitive prices um, we actually compete with the major Chinese uh, suppliers by price but we have the um, reliability and the safety that, like, I, that I've learned we have to have in Germany um, and we bring that together. And like when one of our customers realizes that something went wrong, we really work hard on solving it. So like in some Chinese companies, I heard that let's lose that customer, it doesn't matter. We have to get over it, we have to get this finished. And that's what we never do. We, we say we have to solve this issue. Like, so if a customer calls and says something arrived and it's bad, then I feel terrible. This is not what should happen. And it's not about, okay, how can we get out of this problem with losing the least amount of money? It's more like, how can we make sure that um, this customer gets to achieve his goal, like to grow his company and this does not impact his business badly? Because it's like, on the, you have to look on the long term horizon and um, you have to go all the way with your customers together. And sometimes it's really uncomfortable and you have to go through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we build a strong relationship with our customers, and so we give them the price directly. If they want to go out and compete, um, check for competitors, check for a cheaper price, I'm sure they can find a cheaper price, and they're welcome to do so, because then our customers will take over the market and push them out pretty, pretty soon, because we're reliable, we're there when there are problems, we have the highest quality always, and whenever, like, if someone gets a lower quality cheaper, that's not our market, that's not the market that our customers are in, so that's why I'm quite happy to just give up the prices, even though, this issue from the beginning still appears, but it's okay. Yeah, he has a second question about the oh, branding, the right? Yes. Yeah, so about branding. Like um, there are so many different ways to it. For example, if you have a brand, only a brand, then um, 
there are a lot of channels which are close to you, like marketing channels and partnership channels, because you would be competing with other brands. But since we are a supplier, we actually got into contact with a lot of brands that now are very close with us, and they would help us put our brand to the market. So we have a lot of channels. Like by being the supplier of a big part of the market, we have now have a lot of channels open which we can use that will support us to bring our product to the market. That's one way. And because of manufacturing for so many different companies, we learned a lot on the way. And so some customers told us that this is so bad, it's like it could be so much better. And then we asked them, hey, can we use this for our product too? If they're cool with it, which they often are because um, we help them. And like we, we grow together, we always grow together. We make sure our customers grow and our customers make sure we grow. And um, with this way, we have developed a lot of pretty cool products which we offer our customers to use for their own brands, which we now use for our own brand too. Like behind me, this is actually one example. <coughs> so, um, let's say this. So, we have the traditional truck, which is a little heavy, and it's been developed maybe 20 years ago, and it hasn't changed it's since. Time. Okay, yeah, heavy. And that one is not, it's just a 3D, like, uh, uh, sorry. Okay, 3D paint, yeah, uh, spray paint. Because we're just making more fun now. But like, we took the product and we just talked with our customers and we talked with each other and like what they are for, like what they are errors in the product and um, what is wrong, what should be better, and like over the many productions we arranged, we found so many problems that, or parts that could be better. So we put it into this one product. We put everything we learned into one product, and now we have the step of having 3D printed it and then making the mold now too. And then we'll have the best skateboard truck on the market because, like the brands, the skateboard truck brands, they don't experience as much as we do because we have so many brands come to us to run their production, so we learn from all over the spectrum. And if you have a skateboard brand yourself, you don't get that info as fast, except if you are our customer because we want our customers to grow as quickly as possible. So we give all this information to our customers and we put it to our own products. And after developing this own product. Like a lot of companies don't have the money to develop a new truck. And so what we do is we just find away the logo, put their logo on, and accept that they sell it with their own brand. And so this helps our customers grow fast, it allows us to push our own products to the market, and it lets our customers and us overtake uh, all other brands on the market. Yeah, great. So we have two questions left. Oh, please. Uh, according to the YouTube marketing, uh, do you make the YouTube video yourself or outsource to the household? Like, we have a marketing uh, manager. He tells me exactly what we have to do. And um, then after that, we just follow his instructions, but then we make the videos ourselves. So, Damien does the editing currently. We're lucky that our sales uh, is also good at editing. It's seldom luck. Like this, but yeah, he's great at editing, so he edits the videos. Um, and actually, like, we found an interesting thing about marketing online and making YouTube videos. Like, you've got those terrible videos, a cell phone that's shaky that you point yourself, and you've got the highly professional videos, but everything that's in the middle is bad. So, like, if you make an advertisement that looks like you wanted to make a professional advertisement, but you cut it yourself, it's pretty bad. So, if you make it yourself, Make it clear that you made it yourself. If you hire a professional company, they can be professional, but just don't go in the middle. So we do both. We're working on a professional advertisement, and we're doing our own advertisements, but we try to never be in the middle, in between, where it looks like we want to be something or not. So actually, uh, we walk quite often through the office with the cell phone facing on ourselves. Um, like, for example, we get some new products, we just have, take the cell phone, film ourselves, walk in the office, say, hey, look, this is a new truck, or this is a new deck, and uh, we show the different parts, and if the video is good, we put it on YouTube as an advertisement, if it's not good, or just like so-so, then we just send it to one customer that wanted to see it, and, and yeah, those selfie videos, like, it, for them it just really depends on the content, so if the content is great, it doesn't matter, the filming is just, yeah, yourself all the camera. Is it a depend on the description? Uh, if, if the important way you, you want this uh, described, then you make a uh, professional uh, video. Then uh, other things you, you make a mission video. Like, for example, working on a brand uh, video. Um, and 
if you want to present the brand with all these aspects, I think that it has to be made professionally. Uh, with the feeling it's supposed, it's supposed to bring over and with the colors and everything. But if you just want to explain a business process or a new product, then the selfie video is enough. Okay. Last question. Yeah, Ali? Can you show us the skateboard trick? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, oh, I'm just always worried about the glass wall. Is that the last question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, please. <laughs> oh, that's, that's putting me on the spot there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow.